It's almost a joke when I started in social psychology. You're going to study love? How can you study that scientifically? We're talking about something that's central and intense. It's not practical or ethical to manipulate that in the laboratory. The laboratory is the single most powerful means that social psychology has, a laboratory experiment. We randomly assign people to groups, see what happens. We can't randomly assign someone to fall in love with someone. We've actually tried that in our lab. It's difficult, but it's difficult uh, in practice and it's difficult ethically to do it in a way that works. There's also the problem that we're dealing not just with one person, but with one person's relation to another. And also we're interested in what happens over time. It's nice to have someone in the lab for 10 minutes or an hour, but we need to know what happens over a year or two or three years. It's difficult to keep track of people. Uh, people drop out, they leave, and then your, your groups aren't representative anymore. Uh, you don't have enough people. So it's a difficult area. But mainly it's difficult because the ideas we're dealing with are ones that are long-standing in the culture, they're important to people, and they're mushy. And we're trying to get a precise handle on what is ultimately a kind of mushy thing. Basically, psychologists, and I'm no exception, we use any method we can get our hands on. We use multiple methods. We use interviews, we use observations, we track relationships longitudinally over time. We torture our participants <laughs> when they come in uh, to our lab by getting them to fill out reams of questionnaires. It's almost ironic to think this way, but the most important methodological tool that someone who's really interested in understanding relationships needs is statistics, statistics, and more statistics. To me, statistics are a beautiful thing because you can paint a picture about a relationship or about a person's role within a relationship with statistics that is really a work of art. You can extract information that isn't readily apparent from a very complex and sophisticated understanding and so the beauty of, the, of statistics as a tool is in their ability to take a maze of information that looks like a mess in its face and turn it into something that's comprehensible and informative and insightful. I have used a pretty diverse range of methods. I think in some ways I'm, I'm a little bit unusual. For example, uh, some of my research on sexual identity involves doing qualitative, in-depth interviews with women over time, where I ask them to reflect on their personal experiences, I follow them, you know, over the lifespan. I also have a psychophysiological laboratory where I study sort of biological aspects of interpersonal relationships. I, I have, for example, romantic couples come into my laboratory, I measure their cardiovascular functioning, I measure their neuroendocrine activity. One of the most interesting pieces of data that I've seen uh, recently was collected by uh, a woman named Meredith Chivers, uh, who did a study in which and she wanted to look at this whole question of whether female sexuality is more fluid than men's. So basically, she has a number, there are a number of devices where you can actually measure blood flow to the genitals to measure sexual arousal. And so she compared women, men, and male to female transsexuals basically showed them sort of stimuli, uh, you know, male stimuli, female stimuli to look, and they, she had lesbian women, straight women, gay men, straight men, then the transsexuals. Um, and basically what she found was that for men, whether they were gay or straight, their arousal response was very target specific. In other words, gay men responded to pictures of other men and, you know, not to women. Heterosexual men responded to women and not to men. Same thing with the male to female transsexuals. Basically, if they said, well, I'm, I'm interested in men, that's what their genitals told us. For women, it was very different. For women, you got this broad spectrum response. Whether they were, fe whether they were lesbian or heterosexual, they responded genitally to images of both men and women. Uh, and that was reflected in their self-report data as well, that they said that they felt aroused by sort of both sets of stimuli. Now, whether it's in the lab or the field, there are different challenges that we face. So first I'll mention with the field studies, uh, a comment that an experimentalist once made to me, uh, a guy who always did lab experiments, and he said, John, he said, you seem to do these field studies, but you seem to have fate 
naturally assigning people to condition or randomly assigning people to condition. The idea is to try to catch people at times in their lives where something will happen to them that will sort of uh, mix things up. Naturalistic settings are important to relationships because relationship behavior is very much influenced by the context in which beha that behavior occurs. One of the things that has impressed me very much in the past few years is a series of findings that show that the most common place that conflict occurs in the house is the kitchen. To me, it's very interesting that when we study conflict in the laboratory, we have two people sitting at a table talking to each other while being observed in a camera. They're not in a kitchen where there's a refrigerator that they can be snacking from. They're not washing dishes at the same time. There's no telephone ringing in the background. All of these things can subtly change the way that conflict and conflict resolution occur. In the lab, it's a different set of challenges. And what we try to do is actually create a situation that really gets that commitment motive going. Uh, as one of my colleagues said, oh, are you, are you trying to bring lust into the laboratory? Uh, because what we do is we have confederates, people who are working for us, who present themselves as if they're another research participant. And one of my favorite studies is the one where we have someone in the waiting room with a research participant. Uh, she seems to be uh, another research participant. She's working for us. She's an attractive person. And we manipulate whether these guys think she's single versus married. And we look at the effects this has on the guy's willingness to tolerate their own dating partner's transgressions. So when they're reminded that, wow, there's this attractive single person out there, are they as willing to do that? And we find that the guys aren't as willing to do that. And you say, oh, okay, so that's what happens. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. But then when we do it with women, they do the exact opposite. The women actually become more tolerant of their partner when they're with a single attractive guy in the waiting room than when they think the guy is married. So when we found that women reacted differently than men to the attractive alternative, we wanted to show well, what's going on there. And our most recent work is to show that for women, it in fact activates commitment. Now activate, that, that's a cognitive term that we talk about. And what we did was we had women and men just imagine themselves having an interaction with someone of the same sex or someone of the opposite sex, an attractive person. And then we said, oh, here's a filler task, just something to do for a couple of minutes. And what it was were a set of what are called word fragments. You get a few letters, and you have to fill in the other letters to figure out what the word is. Women, when they were thinking about being with an attractive guy, filled in the blanks with commitment words. Commitment was brought to mind when they were thinking about being with an attractive single guy compared to when they were thinking about being with some woman. With guys, no. It didn't happen. So thinking of the attractive single woman did not prompt them to think about commitment. It's clear that when you're studying an area such as intimate relationships, you can't rely on any one method. It's always a matter of trying to use a convergence among multiple methods and hoping that by using different kinds of methods, you can nonetheless find sufficient consistency that eventually a clear picture emerges that is not dependent upon any particular methodology. We are now at a point where there are many developments methodologically that enable our research to become in some ways more sophisticated, whether it is being able to tap much more into what people are doing on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis through remote assessments of physiological, kinds of responses, whether it includes brain imaging that will become more sophisticated so that in real interactions we can see some of the machinery, so to speak, that underlies many of our emotions and attitudes. And that will complement a lot of the other techniques that we have and will enable us to go, I think, to the next level in gaining data.